Hello and welcome to the MDS podcast, the official podcast of the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. I'm Sarah Schaefer from the Yale School of Medicine, and today I have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Rob DeBee, a professor of neurology at Amsterdam University Medical Center. Today we're going to be talking about his paper that will be published in the June 2024 issue of the Movement Disorders Journal and is currently available online, long-term follow-up of the LEAP study, early versus delayed levodopa in early Parkinson's disease. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sarah. So first, could you please review briefly the initial LEAP study and its results? So the initial LEAP trial was set up to investigate whether levodopa has a disease-modifying effect. And to distinguish between a direct symptomatic effect and a disease-modifying effect, we used the randomized delayed start design. And in this study, 445 patients with early PD who had not yet used any medication were randomized into two groups. So one group of patients received levodopa, 100 milligrams three times a day for 80 weeks. And the other group first received the placebo three times a day for 40 weeks, which was followed by levodopa, 100 milligrams three times a day for the next 40 weeks. Thus, both groups were followed for 80 weeks. And if at the end of the 80 weeks, there was a difference in severity of symptoms between the two groups, this difference would be due to the difference in treatment during the first 40 weeks, as one group received levodopa and the other received placebo. And this effect would have persisted throughout the second 40 weeks. The outcome of the LEAP trial was that at the end of the 80 weeks, there was no difference in the severity of Parkinson's symptoms between the two groups. And this outcome supports the hypothesis that levodopa does not have a disease-modifying effect. And so this was an extension study of that trial that went on for five total years of follow-up for these patients. What was the rationale for the extension study? So we measured the severity of the disease with the UPRS. And in the LEAP trial, all patients used levodopa during the second 40 weeks. So at the end of the 80 weeks, the UPDRS score was almost the same as at baseline. It is possible that the use of levodopa and its symptomatic effect masked any potential difference in disease progression between the two groups. We could have chosen to measure the patients during a standardized off phase, but so early in the disease, there is no guarantee that the effect would have worn off after 12 or 24 hours. And this procedure would also likely have a negative effect at the retention rate. And we also did not have the financial resources for this. So if levodopa indeed has no disease-modifying effect, then there should also be no difference between the two groups after five years. So with additional funding, we were able to test this hypothesis. An advantage of this was that we could verify the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease after five years and thus repeat the analysis with patients whose disease was more certain. Yeah, in those early patients, you definitely need to be cautious about that long dose effect, which we've covered in this podcast and in previous episodes. How did you ultimately conduct the follow-up? So after three and five years, we remeasured the severity of the disease using the UPDRS and the use of anti-Parkinson medication. In addition to these comparisons, we also grouped UPDRS items into levodopa responsive and less levodopa responsive symptoms. Unfortunately, we only received sponsorship for the follow-up study after some of the patients had already passed a three-year mark. This does not introduce bias, but it does result in slightly less statistical power at the three-year point. The five-year mark is the most important measurement point in this study, though. And what did you find? So, after three and five years, there was also no difference in disease severity, progression, motor fluctuations, and no difference in the amount of medication used. So, this finding supports the idea that levodopa does not influence disease progression. 
I found it interesting that there was not only no difference in UPDRS scores or markers of progression, but that there was also no difference in motor fluctuations, which, as I'm sure you know, is a big debate about how much levodopa and early start levodopa might contribute to that. So the LEAP study ultimately set out to determine if levodopa affects disease course. Do you think at this point we've answered the question? I actually think we have. If levodopa does have any effect on disease progression, it is very small and negligible compared to its symptomatic effect. What are the take-home points for providers who treat Parkinson's patients, in your view? So the main message is that you can tell now patients that it has been proven that levodopa does not affect disease progression. It is different from saying it has not been proven that levodopa accelerates disease progression. You can start with levodopa if needed. And if you're unsure about the right time to start, it does not matter if you start a little earlier. However, this is not a license to use it unnecessarily or a too high dose. There is also no positive long-term effect of early levodopa use. So people early in the disease with no a few functional limitations can still participate in scientific research that requires delaying the start of levodopa. Sounds good. So basically use your clinical judgment. <laughs> yes. <sir. laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today and for telling us about your study and what conclusions you drew. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed the conversation about this paper, you can further your experience with continuing medical credits, or CMEs. You can find the link to the journal CME course for this paper within the episode description on the MDS website. Journal CME is planned and implemented in accordance with the accreditation requirements of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, ACCME. The International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society is accredited by the ACCME to provide a continuing medical education for physicians. The International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society designates this education activity for a maximum of one AMA PRA Category 1 credits. The views and opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society or their affiliated journals, Movement Disorders and Movement Disorders Clinical Practice. Any disclosures of the participants can be found within the episode description located on the MDS website.